My name is Elad. Uh, I work at uh, TerraSky as a tech lead. And I want to discuss with you today about the misadventure of, uh, misadventure of disaster recovery in Kubernetes. I would like to introduce uh, Dave. Dave is a senior DevOps engineer, like both of, uh, most of you here. And he just got a task today in the morning. His boss told him that it's got a very interesting uh, stuff to do today he will be responsible for his company disaster recovery. So it's an amazing task. Why not jump to work? Um, the first step, like everyone else doing in disaster recovery, is just wait for someone else to do it. I think this is a very good tip, and we can just grab the coffee today, right now, uh, but it's not gonna work. So again, my name is Elad, I work at TerraSky. TerraSky is uh, mostly working in cloud native companies that try to get more, uh, um, more cloud native solution in their Kubernetes journey. It means like starting from fresh with one cluster, how to add more cluster, how to manage aspects like security, disaster recovery that we're gonna speak today. So let's state this, set the stage for our story. So in Dave company, we have two AWS regions, US East and US East 1 and US East 2. He got EKS cluster already provisioned each uh, of the regions. He wants disaster recovery, but they, they need to decide by himself what is meant for him to do disaster recovery. So at first, this is a slide I took from a Microsoft, uh, uh, sorry, AWS blog about disaster recovery. We need to decide which kind of disaster recovery strategy our company need. It could be started from a, a RP or RT of hours when it's really not a production environment to be realistic. But in most of uh, production scale environments, company will go for a warm standby where the RP RT is few minutes. And if the scale need and the interruption need to be almost nothing, they will go with the active active where you barely have an RTO or RPO, that I need to be synchronized and be up to date in both of the clusters. But as many of you know, when we moved to Kubernetes, a lot of the IT challenges that past was managed by IT, Linux administrators, it was shifted into the developer. So anything, all of the work that was just now was responsibility of our IT guys, is now is our responsibility, because Kubernetes is shifting toward self-service management. If you're a developer, if you're a security guy, you're gonna handle this. And this is something that is more complex. So right now we need to decide, Dev is asking himself, who's responsible for the cluster? Is it the IT manager or the DevOps team, or it's the development team that spin up the new cluster? So this makes Dev some kind frustrated. How are we gonna solve it? So I think that the best thing for Dave to do is to decide, okay, this is an ecosystem of a Kubernetes cluster, an abstract one, of course. I think that the first thing you need to decide is, okay, I'm gonna see a lot of moving parts. Which one of them I need to, to do a backup and disaster recovery? All of them or nothing? So at first, he's looking on the basic building parts of Kubernetes. So we have a stateful in Kubernetes and we have a stateless in Kubernetes. So obviously, you say you see in the stateful, you see stateful set, persistent volumes, and of course the usage, uh, use of it by persistent volume claims, and deployment, ephemeral storage, job and cron tabs. This is okay. This is good, but what it mean actually in my production environment, in my workload? So to get more information about it, he understands that he need to back up the etcd. Maybe there are databases that are spinning in his Kubernetes clusters. Uh, maybe there is applications that store application state, some kind of uh, Redis instance, store page, store, uh, store page messaging system like uh, RabbitMQ. He understands that he needs to, be, to back up this kind of workload. But what about the stateless? In stateless, he understands that he have, for example, CI/CD pipelines running his Kubernetes cluster. We see a lot of companies today running the uh, Jenkins workloads in Kubernetes. Uh, he's got his web server, his static content, content that he may also run in on Kubernetes. And he thinks this is something that could be put aside as part of this disaster recovery strategy. So 
what is the best way to go when we're working with a stateless-based workloads? So I think that when we're talking about stateless workloads, we need to do maintenance. It's less of disaster recovery. We need to isolate some kind of unhealthy nodes, and this could be done without a backup recovery strategy. Uh, if we have workloads that we need to change, we can drone them, do cordon and drain them, and then spin up new nodes, but again, without losing my complete cluster. Another thing we can do is to provision replacement nodes. But again, he seems to, to understand that stateless workloads, while need some kind of maintenance in his cluster, it's not actually a disaster recovery challenge because if my worker nodes are running stateless uh, uh, application by nature, this is all just moving stuff, but again, the cluster itself can be provisioned uh, uh, without any need to backup. And of course, the best strategy to do so is you can keep another uh, active, uh, another uh, active active topology with two EKS cluster or more. But eventually, if you have 100% uh, coverage, almost 100% coverage in infrastructure as code, you can spin up a new cluster. Your workloads will just spin up in the new cluster. You need to rewrite your DNS records, maybe, but this is it. You don't need to persist any data and backup it. So let's take a look on the very simple uh, applications. We have a deployment of a simple app. As we can see, the pod itself has a, a um, container that is using a sample, app, a sample app with specific version, and his persisting is requiring persistent volume claim called sample PVC. And of course, you can see that is referencing to persistent volume and define how much storage it's gonna take, and of course, really depends on uh, the cloud vendor that you're running it could be allocated some kind of EBS or anything else in your cloud vendor persist. And this is how it look like. We have a sample application, that's a deployment that's spinning up a pod. The pod has requested persistent volume claims from a persistent volume that will ask for specific storage like EBS from the cloud vendor itself. In order to solve this, we need to, we need to understand that we need to back up the data. Are you familiar with Valero? I think that this project is uh, an open source project from VMware. Uh, it's running for the five, six, last five to six years. And it's basically gonna cover you anything you need to back up inside your uh, Kubernetes uh, clusters. And to do so, the main job that Valero is doing is perform a full or a selective update, a selective uh, uh, backups of your cluster, and he able to persist the volume claims into your cloud storage, and you're gonna see an example. Another thing is you're doing is really help us in the disaster recovery. So if we don't have an active, active uh, uh, disaster recovery strategy, then we can use this backup, put it in an S3 bucket, for example, and then utilize uh, Valero CLI, for example, to restore it in our destination disaster recovery cluster. And another thing, it, it's supporting uh, uh, automatic backups in a regular interval. We're gonna see an example for it. And also, another thing when you, when you think about Valero, it's gonna help you also to migrate cluster. Sometimes when your disaster recovery is also consists of cluster migration, then you can use Valero to take a snapshot of your current production, then spin up a new, uh, for example, EKS, the latest version 1.19, I think think so, this is uh, one of the latest version, check it, and then migrate fully into production. How it works? So it's uh, basically, you're gonna head to your Helm repository, the VMware Tanzu, as you see here, and then just install the Helm, Helm chart itself. Uh, what's gonna happen behind the scene is that you're able to change configuration, so for example, you can say how I'm going to connect to my EKS cluster, uh, the credentials, you're gonna set the plugin to support EKS in this example, and you're gonna set the role that you're using for performing backup and disaster recovery. This is the example. And this is gonna be part of your hand-based installation. How the level workflow is looking? Uh, basically, they have a CLI. This is uh, one of the uh, ways that you can run backup and disaster recovery. As you see here, I have the Kubernetes uh, API, 
they're going to install new CRD that will be part of uh, your uh, operation. You can run the, the command here, create a my backup, include which namespaces you want, and a snapshot volume. Then Valero behind the scene will have a Kubernetes uh, uh, operator that will be uh, spin up in your cluster, in each cluster that you're installing. He will perform the backup and, for example, take the snapshot and copy it into your blob storage. And of course, when you need to do a restore, you can use a CLI on the other end, on your, on your DR cluster, just to uh, uh, restore the data itself. But again, this is uh, a bit simplistic. Another way that we see customers managing is by doing uh, scheduled backups. As I said, uh, Valero is part of the Helm installation installing a new CRD. One of them is called backup. Here you can define which namespace I would like to take uh, uh, the backup from, which pods, uh, even to be more precise, which of the persistent volumes that I want to do. You can spin up where it needs to, uh, to be kept, what is a TTL before it's going to delete some kind of previous backup uh, 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 that he has done. Do I want to use uh, the snapshot volume? And if you know, guys, the snapshot volume is one of the, uh, I think it will introduce like two or three versions of Kubernetes, gives the ability to use via Kubernetes and Valero the exact mechanism that you do when you're using, for example, directly backup in EBS and creating EBS snapshot. He's really going to create an EBS snapshot. And the benefit of it is that you're leveraging the cloud native technology and just getting, for example, only the differentiation bet uh, between the previous snapshot to the one that you're currently using. And of course, other settings. And in order to make it run a, a schedule, you just need uh, uh, to, to set up another CRD called schedule. You're going to set up the cron, cron job for it. This is for in, in this example, it's running every day. And of course, behind the scene, what's happening, this is what uh, is going on here. So we have the control plane where we install the CRD uh, at the Helm charts and installing all the CRD. Then it's going to uh, perform from this cluster the backup operations. Then on the customer VPC, he will be installing the backup controller and running this operation on this specific uh, cluster. And of course, when it's completed, he's going to send it, for, for example, for a S3 bucket to be kept. And the same thing happens also in the destination cluster when some uh, accident happens. W Another thing that we, when we discussed about, about disaster recovery is that sometimes even taking the snapshot and let's say the granularity will be even every one minute. When a live system is working, even the delta of one minute can be crucial for your application. So in heavy, intensive, active, active top topology, this is not the way to go. You're still gonna get gap even if it's one minute and in this case, you're gonna see, for example, other solution like Portworks. They have a commercial offering that give you even a, a replication latency of 10, less than 10 milliseconds to update it. So what I want to, to say here that the solution that you're striving, the solutions that you're striving to, to, uh, to create in a company really depends on the, what is the RPO and RTO of your company. So for example, for a startup company, uh, they don't, don't have too much rights in the system, and they understood that they can use RPO and RTO of maybe a few minutes, then going full-blown solution with uh, Portworks and paying a lot of money for it, maybe it's not relevant for them. But for a big customer, when it's really critical, even fraction of a second to lose data, you can see other solution. But I think we maybe forgot something. We talk about our stateless workloads. What about the etcd itself? Are we going to backup it as well? Because Valero is focusing on persistent storage. What do you think? So I'm not presuming to say this is 100% true, but you may not need to backup it specifically. Why? The first one is because most of the Kubernetes vendors uh, providers vendors, they already provide a backup solution for the complete cluster. And if they provide it, inside they're also gonna backup the etcd service itself. Another thing that if you're going to go with the 
companies that most of the workload are stateless in nature, then the etcd is just a reflection of our pod and workloads. So I can just use infrastructure as code and recreate my etcd. I'm not keeping any real state there. And in other companies, we see that they're using etcd in a replicated mode. So they have multi-cluster, okay? So in this very simple way that I describe it, you have just one EKS cluster in each region. But in a very realistic production, it's not gonna be just one. It's gonna be few of them, and they replicate the etcd between them. So a failure in one other Kubernetes cluster on the same region will have a replication of the etcd service itself. And of course, as I said, because of the dynamic nature of Kubernetes, resources like pods and nodes are being constantly uh, uh, created and evicted and destroyed. So it's just reflecting the state that we're currently today, and it could be just rerun again and again and again without the real need to, to replace or backup and restore the etcd server. So let's take another look of a networking aspect uh, of what it means to be in an active, active environment of Kubernetes cluster. So let's start with the stateless deployment. We have no incoming traffic, we have no ingress. This is our application. As we see, we have deployment, and we have the templates that represent a very simple pod. As you see, we have two instances, because this is the way we decided, this is what Dave decided, to have a disaster, disaster recovery. So it is breezy, this is really simple. Why? Because it could be deployed to one cluster and also to be deployed to the next cluster. And in a case of emergency, if something happened, we can just switch the clusters uh, or we can be in active active with some kind of a, 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 a DNS record for an alias, a, a fully qualified domain name, that I will change upon something happened to my cluster. Let's make it a bit more complex. So right now, we have a stateless deployment, but we do have an ingress. We do have incoming traffic. Uh, there is no encryption, it's okay. And we decide to do a manual DNS, and this is how it's gonna look like. So we have a deployment. Now we're exposing, as you see, the container port is exposed to port 80. We have a service, and again, we have an ingress to expose it outside. For example, this uh, based on Nginx ingress, if it's running under EKS, we're gonna have a load balancer exposed to a users and expose our service. And here it's still easy. Why? Because I can still deploy to one cluster and to the second cluster. And in the case of uh, some kind of emergency, yes, I can switch clusters. If I have two clusters, I just need to redirect the traffic from one cluster to another via DNS and it could be by any, uh, 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 any uh, uh, policy. I can use round robin, wait, I can check the health and make sure by metrics if my cluster alive or not. So this is really simple. But as we say in the beginning, Kubernetes is the empathize of self-service. And if you're familiar, I'm sure you're familiar with Cert Manager and Core DNS. You, got, you now have the ability to manage your clusters, and this is something that in the past was managed by system administrators of, or done by security. As a developer, you can spin up your cluster and also managing your DNS records and also man uh, creating an SSL certificate for TLS, uh, a TLS uh, uh, SSL termination for your service. And so imagine a world when I can create this DNS record, I can create my certificate, and it could be done with the, both of these projects. Take a look on this YAML, for example. So this is my sample application. Now I create the ingress, but now I have two annotations. The first annotation is a cert manager, and I'm using Let's, Let's Encrypt to do the issuer. As you know, Let's Encrypt, it's an open source project. It's gonna give you three months. If you're not gonna buy the service as the uh, commercial offering, they're gonna give, gonna give you three months of certificates, and it will be checked by your DNS, created a specific DNS records, or by domain email. It's a bit cumbersome, but again, it can be automated. And in this example, a developer spinning, uh, creating this ingress is able to create SSL certificates and also is able to register his ingress, uh, uh, let's say for example, AWS load balancer, 
is going to be able to create loud uh, 53 records under main terraskyctoplayground.com. And as you can see here, I'm defining everything else. And of course, I'm setting the TLS, so I will be able to, uh, to make sure that my domain is registered for this uh, specific URL. But with great power come some kind of a headache. Why? Because let's talk about, again, about our, start, our, our company. So uh, we have Route 53. Uh, we have the main TS CTO playground. And we can presume this is the URL that we use by our customers. It can be service. It could be end users. We have two clusters, US East 1 and US East 2. But I see a problem here. I see that I have two ingress. One is a disaster recovery, and one, of course, in my main clusters. What's going to happen if I'm going to run the, this one, if I'm going to run external DNS with the same domain name? What is going to, be, what's going to happen? So I cannot deploy the same ingress twice. What's going to happen behind the scene that if I have an active, active a disaster recovery strategy, the first one will be our main cluster. But then when I provision my DR cluster, it's just going to override the record in my route 53. So I've done nothing here. So in order to solve it, we're going to do the following. We're going to have an ingress uh, in each of the cluster, as you see here. One is for the disaster recovery, and one is with the primary. We're going to do anything. We're going to say, uh, OK, you can register the route 53 for each of them, but not for the main. OK, so you'll be able to communicate internally, for example, in each one of them. And then you're going to do the following. You're going to use external DNS uh, annotation. It's going to create the record. But because you're keeping the value empty, it will not change it. So your disaster recovery strategy here, if you're going back into the diagram, is to say, OK, I will have, for example, Amazon Route 53 policy. And for example, checking metrics on live healthness of my main cluster, I will automatically change the, the value from my main cluster into my disaster recovery. And this I will do in order for, for the service itself to provision the DNS record. But updating the record itself will be dynamically based on logic that I will be doing myself. Another example is, and as you see here, it's already created the uh, main playground.com. But as you see here, we got two ingresses, the primary and the disaster recovery. In my logic, because there is no, no, there is no uh, uh, incident in production, my logic is just pointing into the primary. And then I can automatically can change it based on metrics, based on whatever switch that you decide. Another thing is with the certificates. Let's take another look. So we have the main TS uh, CTO playground. This is the URL that we want to expose. But the problem, it doesn't match the DR or the primary. So how can I create a certificate for main where it's actually my logic ingress that exposing my production or disaster recovery? How are we going to solve it? I'm going to solve it by doing the following. As you can see here, each one of the cluster, I will have the ingress. And this is tricky. Because when you provision an SSL certificate, let's say, as I said, let's encrypt, when you're defining the secret itself, he will provision the private key to be exposed. So we're going to split it into two parts. One of them is the ingress itself of the application, where we're going to say this is primary, TSCTO playground. This is on our main cluster. We're going to set the TLS for both of the hosts, both main and primary. 
And we're going to keep the secret here. And in our main one, which is, as I said, the logic one that could be, be once as a disaster recovery and, of course, our main clusters, we're going to skip this part. We're only going to reference the secret name. So we're going to expose it as main TSCTO and a primary one but without the annotation of the search manager. So basically, what this pa pa pattern shows us is that I will create two ingresses, two main ingresses. In my main production cluster, I will create one that's using host main and primary, and I will have an ingress for the main that will just pinpoint to the secret that created it, and my, on my DR, I will do, I will do the same, but in the, in the array of host, I will just use, instead of primary, I use the disaster recovery. And what's gonna happen, that when I'm gonna do SSL termination check, he will know that he got both of them. So if I'm running OpenSSL as client and connecting to my main server, I can see that the Let's Encrypt certificate was created with two alternative, two sense, two alternative names. One of them is the main TSCTO playground, and the second one is a primary. So to summarize everything at, uh, at one, uh, we have two AWS region. We have one EKS cluster on each. We are promoting a self-service so our developers and our uh, teams can provision both DNS and SSL. They're gonna manage certificates and DNS as, we, uh, as I just showed you today. And this is one step toward a functional disaster recovery. And as you can see in, one, uh, in this example, this company, Dave Company, they decided that he, knew he needed a frequent uh, data replication. That in this case, he using a solution like Portworks and any other solution that give, give him near real-time data replication for his storage. But this is only one concern when you're talking about disaster recovery. I think that the main one, and I think uh, I just spoke with uh, one, one of the colleagues here today, is that disaster recovery is something that when you ask every different people, it's gonna tell you something else. And I think that one of the main things that uh, I personally uh, 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 experience with a lot of companies we're doing a consulting with is that they, they design the disaster recovery as they've just do before, done before, but they don't have a way to simulate it. And in this case, um, is it means that disaster recovery drills are only gonna happen when something happens in productions. So here, for example, I will present to you Chaos Mesh. Chaos Mesh gives you the ability to create uh, control experiments in Kubernetes, in cloud native exp experience as we use it today, to check your uh, uh, system reliability without waiting for disaster to come and then check if it's happened or not. Let's take uh, two examples. And again, this is nice because it's 100% cloud native project, and as any other project, it's main CRDs, we're going to install uh, the Helm charts. We're, go we're going to get a pod chaos, for example. And let's take Dave Company, for example. We have here, when we apply it into our cluster, a pod chaos. Um, it's going to do a, a pod kill, and it's going to run it for a specific uh, selector. In this case, this is really simply just the primary cluster. But this is, uh, this is very naive because, again, he's using deployment. I'm guessing it has some kind of at least basic policy, and if one pod uh, uh, will be killed, another pod will be spin up. So this is not the way to check a disaster recovery. Another way is to do some something more interesting. As, you said, as I uh, explained before, Dave's strategy is to create main ingress in each uh, uh, region, and then decide by himself, for example, you gotta have metrics about how much connection does, for example, our application can get per, per minute. And there, we can do something more interesting. We can do a, net, net, a network partitioning. When we do a network partitioning and we say mode all and direction two, it means that a cluster is functional but cannot do, uh, but do not connect to the internet. 
So in our perspective, what's going to happen is that the metric in CloudWatch that's going to take a, an active, uh, let's say, a, a transaction per minute, going to have a zero. And in this case, what's going to happen, we can then simulate, for example, this is for a duration of one hour, which is much, much too much. Uh, we're going to do it, for example, again, the main thing in chaos is that you not really want to create a chaos. This is chaos. I just destroy my cluster. So this is funny, but this is not the way to go. What you're going to do is to say, let's do it for a duration like one minute, and let's make sure that my metric is going to check doing heartbeat on my actual transaction per, let's say, for seconds, and the TTL will be uh, uh, very low so we can switch and check everything is working. So this is another example. But I think that the main takeaway that I want you to take from here is that DR is a true Pandora box. Uh, company are mostly focused, as I started today, on data. They think that the only thing they need to, 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 to uh, uh, decide in the disaster recovery strategy is just how to back up my persistent volume claim. This is not the case. Uh, not everything even need to be, repli need to be uh, restored or replicated. As we see, sometimes the etcds, etcds that we are so obsessively want to back up, not, to be back, not, to, not need to be backed up at all. And again, sorry for my English. Um, but another thing that we see is that because the R is mostly done theoretically, we are don't thinking about connectivity, which is one of the main important things, and we ignore it to the last minute. And of course, Kubernetes is not going to work in encapsulated work. You have the manifest repository uh, where you kept your code and GitOps-based configurations. You have the image and the artifacts. Uh, monitoring, CI, CD. Let's say, for example, something happened, okay, and I saw it in production. Companies spend a lot of money for their, for their disaster recovery, but they need to work with the disaster recovery and patch a new version software. But their CI CD wasn't part of the disaster recovery. So what I'm going to do, I cannot patch a very important security patch. So we need to understand that if we want to, want to invest in disaster recovery, it's not just my cluster. It's not just my persistent volume claim. We need to understand, first of all, what is my commitment? Do I a very early stage startup and I can bear even a few minutes of, of uh, uh, downtime and I cannot spend this uh, endless uh, efforts on, uh, on optimizing my dis disaster recovery cluster? Or I'm fully blown enterprise company with even regulations and it's, be it's demanded that I will set up a proper disaster recovery strategy. So I think that Dave is a bit more happy. He's happy, I think, because we have a break in two seconds. And I thank you so much for your time. And if you have any more questions, I would love to hear. Thank you. Does that require a DNS01 verification over HTTP01 to be able to do the uh, the host name? The, you, you were showing us how you could not set the host name and allow it to set once. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you're able to get cert resolution uh, if it's a HTTP01 check. Um, uh, you are right, but again, when you're installing a, a cert manager, you are able to use service account that will provision the records in your route 53. So uh, cert let's encrypt, for example, we are able to verify it. This is how they decide, because what's happening behind the scenes is that in your cluster, you're installing the Helm chart of let's encrypt, for example, and then you're going to give it permission with a service account for your route 53. And every time you got a new record, a new requirement for a SSL certificate, then he will validate it on your Route 53. So the base domain needs to be registered before you can use it. Understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Right.